Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this third event of the 2024 Future Proofing Europe series, which is sponsored by the Department of Foreign Affairs. We're delighted to be joined today by State Secretary Andrea Metelko Shagombic, who has been generous enough to take time out of a busy schedule to speak to us. The State Secretary will speak for, to us for about 20 minutes or so, and then we will go to a Q&A with our audience. You can join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screens. And do please give your name and affiliation with your questions or comments. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. Please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter or X using the handle at IIEA. We are also live streaming this morning's discussion, so a very warm welcome to all of you tuning in via YouTube. So now let me introduce our speaker this morning. Andrea Metelko Zagombic is the State Secretary for Europe at the Croatian Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs. Prior to assuming this post in 2017, she held several prominent posts in the ministry, including Chief Legal Advisor and Assistant Minister for European Law, International Law and Consular Affairs. She is also the Senior Representative of the Republic of Croatia on the Standing Joint Committee on Succession Issues relating to the former Yugoslavia. And she is President of the Commission of the Government of the Republic of Croatia for Borders. So we're very interested to hear her presentation. And without further ado, I will hand over to you, State Secretary. Well, thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. I would uh, really like to thank the Institute of International and uh, European Affairs for this invitation uh, to share insights on the EU enlargement to the Western Balkans, uh, which is a topic of the great importance uh, for Croatia, uh, given the fact that Western Balkan countries are in our immediate neighborhood. And I'm really honored to be part of this future proof in European, Europe project and uh, to exchange views on a number of issues relating to the past, present, and also to the future of the EU enlargement. Uh, it is great to have this conversation with you just a few days ahead of the 20th anniversary of the so-called Big Bang enlargement which I believe uh, has a special meaning also for you in Ireland, since your presidency oversaw the largest ever enlargement in 2004. And uh, I'm, this is really something you should be very proud of. So I would say good news is that enlargement is back on our agenda after years of being uh, left somehow to some kind of bureaucratic autopilot. Um, now it is in our focus again. Uh, let me just remind you that even a few years ago, enlargement was not even mentioned in the strategic documents of the uh, EU. And uh, it was uh, in 2020 when we prepared for Croatia's first ever presidency of the EU that we really wanted also to put enlargement uh, back on the spot. And our main goal was also to put enlargement somewhere back uh, at the EU's back. And uh, at that time, uh, during our presidency, we organized the Zagreb summit. It was in May 2020. Unfortunately, it was a virtual one because of the COVID, if you all, call, uh, all can uh, remember. But uh, this uh, 2020 May Zagreb Summit actually was um, uh, organized 20 years after the historical Zagreb Summit that confirmed uh, the European perspective of Southeast Europe. Uh, and 
for the first time, it was said that uh, EU membership uh, of the countries in the Western Balkans and the Southeast Europe uh, is given, and uh, including uh, for Croatia. This, so this marks the start of our uh, uh, process, which was quite lengthy and demanding, but I would say ultimately it was worth it. So the first Zagreb summit in 2000 was then followed by Thessaloniki summit in 2003, which also reaffirmed the unequivocal, unequivocal support to the European path of the Western Balkan countries. And after this, there was a gap of 15 years with no summits at all. And uh, the first next one was in 2018. It was the Balkan summit in Sofia during the Bulgarian presidency. So we are very happy that since uh, 2020 and our presidency, there are regular annual political dialogue at the highest level between the EU member states and the Western Balkans. And I really believe that we should cherish uh, uh, this new regular meetings on the highest political level. Uh, we very much welcome that Ireland, together with Croatia and some other EU member states, have been a strong supporter of the enlargement. And proof of this uh, was also the recent, I would say it was in January this year, visit of your former Prime Minister Varadkar to Western Balkans, to the region. So we are glad that also Ireland um, follows closely all the developments and is an important partner in this very important uh, EU policy. Um, and of course, uh, with the start of Russian aggression against Ukraine, the enlargement discussion has fundamentally changed. Uh, we may even say that the Russian president Putin has actually expedited the enlargement in the European Union. And uh, in this new geopolitical uh, environment, uh, it even brought EU to give a clear European perspective also to the three countries of the Eastern Partnership. And uh, this all led also to the decisions on opening of the accession talks with Ukraine and Moldova, and also granting the candidate status to Georgia. So in short, uh, the tectonic changes in Europe, security environment, have reinvigorated uh, the uh, enlargement policy and have really opened the way for a quicker enlargement process. This is, of course, uh, as I have already said, uh, really very good news, but uh, still uh, we need to stay focused and we should concentrate our efforts uh, in order to really make this enlargement a reality. Uh, as for Croatia, our advocacy for enlargement policy has been a constant and a strong throughout the years. And we are, will continue to strongly support the enlargement process because of all of its positive effects uh, it has if it's done properly on both sides, uh, both to the exceeding countries, candidate countries, and also on the EU side. So allow me from the, to uh, underline several points uh, on enlargement from the Croatian uh, perspective now. As you know, Croatia joined EU on 1st of um, July, 2013. And I really strongly believe that Croatia's uh, example is a testimony that uh, the enlargement is beneficial to both sides, uh, for the Canada country and for the EU uh, as such. And um, I believe that I can really say that uh, Croatia's accession uh, process is a really a positive story of a successful transformation of a country, uh, which demonstrated both the value of the EU part membership, but also the significance of the enlargement process itself. And I really believe that uh, our example could really serve as a good one also for the all the countries included uh, yet now in the process, both for the Western Balkan countries, but also for this new trio. Allow me just here to say that uh, when it comes to Ukraine, 
we also have some kind of additional uh, connection and empathy. And uh, there are a number of journalists in uh, Ukraine uh, who continue to say that Croatia's remarkable national journey is also a strong uh, source of uh, hope for Ukraine. And I have to admit that they really like uh, that kind of views because they say that in addition, that Croatia uh, gives Ukraine a hope um, um, because of um, some similarities in our, in our development and that um, um, the, um, well, we give the hope that the occupied uh, territories can be uh, returned, that um, reforms can be implemented, uh, and that once, even uh, after having the war, um, one can uh, reach the goal and enter the EU uh, and probably also NATO. So when it comes to Croatia, just let me say that uh, 1st of January of last year, Croatia joined Eurozone and Schengen area. And through joining uh, the Eurozone, our credit rating improved, with, uh, which gave more security, of course, to the investment investors. Our EU membership has uh, had a real positive effect uh, on many aspects of our lives, in particular on growth of production, trade, and macrofinancial stability. The use of EU funds has uh, greatly contributed to a higher living standard of our citizens. Our GDP has increased from 30%, uh, sorry, from 61% of the EU GDP when we joined EU to 73% of the EU GDP's average. Currently, uh, 25 billion euros are available, are available to Croatia uh, from all EU funds, primarily from the current uh, MFF, but also from the EU recovery instrument. And um, uh, this is what gives us some kind of insurance and hope that uh, throughout this uh, period, um, convergence and positive impact uh, of the EU membership will also continue to be visible uh, in the years to come. Unfortunately, Croatia was hit uh, by the earthquake, two of them in 2020, but we also successfully used the EU solidarity funds uh, on combined from those two earthquakes uh, in, in the amount of um, around 1 billion euros, and really believe that all those financial uh, resources will allow us also to move uh, uh, forward. Um, just let me say that uh, we also managed to uh, build a Pelješac bridge. It's a bridge uh, which is a visible symbol of the EU membership of the Croatia. It is the largest uh, infrastructure project in Croatia, co-financed by EU funds. And uh, by this bridge, we have finally connected our land national territory in the south. And this has been a long-standing dream for many of our citizens. And it's so nice that the EU uh, funds uh, made uh, this also um, achievable. So in short, my point would be that uh, we are strong supporting uh, enlargement because um, from our own experience, we know that European path is the right development path uh, for economic prosperity, for democratization, for functioning of the rule of law, and in generally for the better life of the people. So this brings me to my uh, second point which again is based on our own experience that uh, enlargement should be about transformation. Croatia's succession process uh, was proof of the transformative power of the EU enlargement. And uh, at the end of this session negotiations, Croatia was different uh, uh, from the time when we submitted our application for the membership. And I would say, uh, we were better off. 
to put it simple, uh, we really believe that um, this um, transformation is needed and it uh, enables later on the new exceeding country to function better and to function properly as the EU member state. And uh, this is why we really believe that all required established criteria in the process of uh, accession needs to be fulfilled. There's, really, there should not be uh, any shortcuts. Lowering the bar uh, would not bring this transformation on, on behalf of the exceeding uh, candidate uh, country. And later on, this would also negatively uh, in effect, I would say, also on the acceptance of the public of the EU member states when they need to decide ultimately on accepting the new uh, EU member state uh, in the EU. Uh, my third point would be uh, issue of credibility. Uh, the enlargement process really needs to be credible in order to be successful, and it needs to be credible on both sides in the process. Uh, as we all know, uh, for years, uh, um, the perceived perception of uh, the accession path uh, has been very low in the Western Balkan six countries. And they have not really uh, felt uh, as enlargement to be real. And they uh, have often thought that enlargement has become a moving target. And uh, to be honest, they were, some of them were really slowed down also by the objections of certain uh, member states. On the other hand, we also have, uh, have seen a lack of real commitment on part of the uh, countries uh, included in the enlargement process. And uh, they really should also do their homework and um, undertake measurable reforms and adhere to our standards and values. And all, only then uh, this enlargement process can uh, really work. So uh, in the past, when it comes to Western Balkans, the result was a very slow in, uh, enlargement process. Let me just say that the whole enlargement process was actually initiated uh, uh, when the process of uh, stabilization and association was launched. And it was back in 2001 when uh, Croatia signed the agreement on stabilization and association. And it signed at the very same year when North Macedonia did it as well. Uh, and even uh, the agreement uh, with North Macedonia entered one year before Croatia's one in 2004. Uh, Croatia's uh, SAA entered into force in 2005. So just how to have this feeling how long this process of enlargement is going on without any real effect with regard to number of the Western Balkan uh, six countries. Now, uh, after years of waiting, uh, the first intergovernmental conference with North Macedonia and Albania was held in July, 2020. And still at the moment, there is some stalemate of the process and we would really like to see it moving on. Montenegro and Serbia um, got into the process later on. Um, Serbia um, and Montenegro uh, signed the association agreements, SAS, in 2006 and 2007. Later on, they entered into force in 2010. And uh, with regard to Serbia in 2013, uh, now Montenegro and Serbia have been negotiating as we can see for decades, and there is lot, still a lot of work to do. Um, let me also uh, say that Bosnia and Herzegovina also obtained uh, the candidate status uh, only in 2022, and now we are discussing uh, um, how to open uh, the accession negotiations. The decision has been uh, 
adopted, but now we need to uh, agree on the negotiating framework and then really afterwards to launch the, to open the negotiation accession talks as such. Kosovo is um, not even a candidate yet. So uh, the question is now uh, what we should do to make this uh, enlargement when it comes to Western Balkans more dynamic more effective, uh, more successful. And um, I would say that um, we should somehow um, be aware that uh, we should somehow revive the confidence of the West of Balkan six countries into enlargement now, today, when we have EU uh, with enlargement back in focus. Uh, it's been focused due to some other reasons, the Ukraine and this uh, awful uh, war of aggression, but uh, Western Balkan countries should be aware of it and seize them out. Um, and I would say that uh, when it comes to Western Balkans, on the EU side, we have done quite a lot. Um, the new accession methodology was adopted and it was, we are proud to say, this was adopted during uh, our presidency. It was adopted on a General Affairs Council meeting uh, uh, on which I had the pleasure to, to preside during our presidency. Uh, but in addition to that, in addition to this new methodology, now we also do have this uh, new growth plan for Western Balkans, which also enables those countries to close the economic gap and to a link uh, um, availability of those financial uh, resources uh, with the um, link with the implementation of the required reforms. And we really believe that this is a recipe for the success. It can be somehow compared with uh, our EU's um, resilience and recovery plan in which uh, also the EU member states need to fulfill benchmarks and targets uh, agreed in advance. And then once uh, those reforms are achieved, additional financial resources uh, are available to member states. And uh, Croatia has been quite well in this process. And we really believe that that kind of similar mechanism to the Western Balkan countries could also work and uh, uh, gain success. So I would say that all the elements are now in place. We have a renewed political commitment. We have economic package. We have the revised methodology. And now we, uh, we uh, need to find a way how to convince those Western Balkan six countries that they should really do uh, their homework. And if they do it, they would be able to move forward. Um, I believe that, that EU will really honor its uh, commitment, but the candidate countries now need really to show tangible uh, uh, results and adhere to our values, uh, implement especially uh, rule of law, uh, common foreign security policy. And um, one could also see that um, in the past, when there has not been uh, uh, enlargement uh, top priority within EU, uh, the candidate countries were not prompted that much to, in, uh, to undertake reforms. But now, when it's back on uh, the agenda, a recent examples show, for example, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, it managed to move forward to implement uh, certain required uh, steps together with Ukraine and Moldova, and this really prompted uh, those countries to move forward and uh, uh, really to um, to be active on its uh, EU path. My fourth point uh, would also be that EU needs also to be ready for uh, EU twenty seven plus. And uh, when we talk about the future of a large European Union, uh, we need to uh, consider three major topics, how it would reflect on EU policies, how it would reflect on our budget, 
but also how it will reflect on our governance and including on institutional setup and on the uh, decision making process. And I'm sure that you all know that uh, the discussions have already started among ourselves within the EU and with the Council and also wider um, how to prepare ourselves for the future enlargement. Uh, there are not a number of topics which are on the table, including um, what kind of effect it would have on constitutional uh, common institutions, uh, uh, should it be a uh, change in our voting system and decision-making uh, system. So there are a number of topics around it. But be before I go to it, let me, let us, let me just remind ourselves that um, before deciding to embark into, into any kind of treaty change, because a number of those topics would really require treaty change, we should exhaust all options we do have now and which are available in the existing uh, uh, treaties. And um, when it comes to enlargement itself, I would say that uh, enlargement is possible on, uh, on the basis of the present treaty, Lisbon Treaty as such. I think we can all agree that Lisbon Treaty is, is enlargement proof and uh, um, formally, technically, enlargement can be executed also on the basis of a treaty uh, as such. Um, for example, Croatia, when Croatia entered, in our accession treaty, all those technical necessary amendments were agreed in our accession uh, treaty and uh, this enabled uh, Croatia to enter EU and to become part of the EU without any need for, for certain additional uh, changes when it comes to uh, treaties. Uh, and also treaty uh, also um, offers a certain mechanism that could help us also when it comes to accommodate uh, some uh, changes when it comes to institutions. Let me just remind you that composition of the European Commission, number of uh, commissioners uh, is open. It's not uh, strict, uh, provided in the treaty. So we do have within the current institutional set, uh, legal setting have uh, freedom also to, to adjust in view of the future enlargement. When it comes to um, qualified majority voting, um, there are discussions where, whether uh, in certain areas, certain crucial areas uh, at the moment required by the unanimity, we should shift to uh, qualified majority uh, voting. Um, on Croatia's view, I would first like to uh, remind us all that um, all those unprecedented crises which EU has been faced uh, in uh, recent years, uh, show that we did quite well, even with that kind of decision-making uh, uh, mechanism in which uh, we continue to have unanimity in, in a number of important uh, areas. So when it comes to COVID, and even when it comes to our response to the brutal Russian aggression, we managed uh, to come up with the answers, and I think we should be really proud of ourselves for it. And uh, this is a living proof that EU is able effectively also to act also in the current uh, framework. Um, we also believe that um, choice of work and decision-making is a very sensitive and important uh, uh, topic and that consensus building mechanism is really within the DNA of the EU, and uh, it is part of our strength. And uh, from Croatia's perspective, uh, foreign and security policy and taxation uh, should uh, be kept within the decision deciding uh, on uh, with unanimity. Um, this would somehow prevent, sorry, this would also prevent uh, time a little bit. I was, I was sorry. So this would also prevent uh, for mar marginalization of the uh, EU member uh, member states and would 
somehow um, give the feeling of real ownership uh, to the member states of the decisions which are really built on the basis of uh, consensus. Um, just to, uh, to, to finish with the enlargement as such, I would say that um, we really um, are now in the right shape. We should uh, really um, be staunch and decisive in moving forward uh, with these policies and that the enlargement uh, should really continue based on four fundamental principles individual approach, merit-based reports, uh, approach reforms at its core, and fundamentals first. And maybe just to uh, run uh, through um, enlargement when it comes to Western Balkans, um, each and every country now really has a chance to make decisive steps how to move forward. Bosnia and Herzegovina is now in the process of waiting for the EU to prepare the um, negotiating framework, pending also uh, fulfillment on the Bosnia and Herzegovina side, uh, certain addi uh, additional um, requirements. We really believe that this country, Bosnia and Herzegovina, need to be given a chance to move forward. Uh, it uh, need to be given a chance to uh, uh, to um, to move forward within its current institutional setting, which is defined by the Dayton Paris Peace Accord, which enables uh, um, equal rights for three constituent peoples in the uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, I really believe this is the way how uh, this country also can move forward on its EU path. For Albania, North Macedonia, we are waiting for the uh, IGCs to, to open. Montenegro uh, has also um, announced its strong commitment to fulfill additional criteria, even for entering into the new phase of closing uh, certain chapters, and we give them our full support. When it comes to Kosovo, we are glad to see that uh, visa liberalization is in place. And we would really like to see both Kosovo and Serbia to, uh, uh, to dedicate themselves to the dialogue process, because this is also the way in which uh, both of those countries could and should uh, move forward. When it's come to Serbia, I would really like to underline the importance of a common foreign and security policy. And uh, uh, Serbia really needs to align with it. Um, including with a sanction regime. And what we have also seen that the alignment of Serbia with the EU visa regime is also of the utmost importance because its non-alignment has shown in the past uh, that it has a really direct impact on the illegal migration uh, uh, streams. Um, Croatia has... Uh, been, uh, as I said, a staunch supporter to the Western Balkans. We keep on telling them now is the time to act. Uh, and um, we would also like uh, regional cooperation in the Western Balkans to be strengthened and also good neighborly relations. Because um, the fact is that there are still a number of open outstanding issues in the Western Balkans and uh, which really do significantly uh, effect, affect the process, and uh, such as normalization or relationship between Serbia and Kosovo or functioning of Bosnia and Herzegovina are just two examples. And to be honest, the legacy of war of aggression waged by Serbia against the neighbors, um, its neighbors in the process of dissolution of the uh, former Yugoslavia in, at the beginning of 90s, Remain still remain a key challenge, and there are still a number of sensitive issues which need to be addressed: processing of war crimes, uh, resolving fate of missing persons. So there are still a work to do. But with this new reinvigorated enlargement, those countries really do have a chance uh, to move forward. And uh, let me just uh, say that um, this new growth plan for Western Balkans is, of, uh, which I mentioned, is of 
utmost importance. It could really move uh, those countries uh, forward. Croatia has also contributed 2 million euros to the Western Balkans investment framework, which also gives, uh, uh, gives um, impetus for uh, economic development of, the, of those countries. So um, gradual integration, let me just uh, uh, say that uh, this topic is also now part of uh, this renewed focus on enlargement and Croatia is really in favor of it. Uh, under the understanding that uh, this gradual integration can, uh, can be implemented only once when a certain kind of country really fulfills re necessary requirements in the certain respective area. But this is a great mechanism uh, which will uh, provide a, a visible inclusion into certain policies and areas of the, uh, of the candidate countries in the areas where they are willing and able to make reforms and share our values. Um, let me just finish by saying that now we have 10 potential new EU member states and um, I believe that on the EU side, we will also be ready to welcome them uh, uh, when uh, the time will come for them to enter. But in preparation for it, we also need to work hard also on raising the support for the enlargement in our EU member states. And um, for this also, I would say European Commission uh, has a great role to play. And uh, we would also like to uh, invite the Commission to provide us with a various impact assessment on how the enlarged EU uh, can function, and also to provide us with proof that the extended EU will also be in a position to adhere to our values, standards, and that um, it will be beneficial both to citizens of the uh, feeding state, but also to the citizens of the EU member states, and that the whole EU will be able to function uh, um, in the enlarged uh, context. So um, I really believe that uh, now is the time that EU reminds ourselves that uh, enlarging policy is a really uh, overall success story because it brings stability and prosperity to our continent. And Croatia will continue to support it because we really believe, as I said, it is the right development path to democratization, rule of law, and better life for citizens. And it brings peace and security into our neighborhood and um, also uh, is a strong tool in combating influences with the third, I would say, hostile uh, um, activities of the third state into our neighborhood. So thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, stop here. Uh, thank you for, for attention. Sorry if I've been a little bit too long and uh, I'm really now here open for, for questions or for further exchange. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, State Secretary. You know, that's been an extremely interesting presentation and you've, you've covered many points in it. Um, you spoke at the beginning about Croatia's strong support for enlargement, and that very much came through uh, in, the, <clears throat> in the enthusiasm and commitment you showed uh, in the course of your presentation. So thank you very much for that. Um, when the European Council last month approved the accession or the opening of the accession negotiations with Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, the foreign, ministry, foreign minister of that country said that this would not have happened without the support of Croatia. So um, what do you think were the most important and impactful ways that Croatia was able to help uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina to reach that point where accession ne negotiations could be opened? And by extension, perhaps, um, what do you think that Ireland could do to help any of the countries in the Western Balkans uh, to uh, advance their accession prospects? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I would say that, um, first of all, Bosnia and Herzegovina is our neighboring state. We have more than 1,001 kilometer long border. Mm. Uh, um, 
we have very close connections to it. It is a state in which it is a three nation state in which uh, Croatian Croats also do live. So we have number of uh, knowledge about uh, that country and uh, we somehow try to convince them that now is the time to act. As I said, uh, throughout the times, uh, uh, this enlargement process in Western Balkans lost its um, uh, lost its um, effect because it lasted for a very long period of time. So we said, now you should really fulfill those required uh, criteria. And to be honest, uh, um, also on the on the side of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, one, year, one and a half years ago, they had a change of government. And uh, this new government is for the first time the government which has a clear uh, EU agenda. And the parties who gathered within uh, on the in the coalition made it crystal clear that they want to move forward on, on, on the EU path. And this also enabled them to uh, adopt uh, various laws, strategies, action plans, to start negotiating with um, Frontex uh, to combat migration, uh, illegal migration. So uh, this new government had uh, uh, made uh, uh, in this one and a half year time much more than uh, the whole government, previous government in, 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 in four years uh, mandate. Um, and this is why we really believe that we should give uh, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina now further support to strengthen those pro-European forces in Bosnia and Herzegovina and to show them that if they deliver, if they reform, if they, they will also now have the possibility also to use those additional funds, if they deliver, they can move forward and then they uh, build um, prosperity in the country. And I believe that Ireland, uh, who's always been also the strong supporter of the enlargement, now we do see how close we have uh, our position is also when it comes to Ukraine. We keep on assisting them, providing the chance. And we are so glad that Ukraine has also uh, been given the chance also to move forward on the, on the EU path. We would also invite uh, Ireland um, to one part of uh, your attention dedicate to the Western Balkans, and I would say Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also North Macedonia, which has been in the process for so, so many years, decades. And uh, you lose your focus if you are in the process for such a long period of time. And then you are also open for foreign, foreign uh, influence and, you know, uh, there is fatigue also on reforms within the society. It would be great if North Macedonia would uh, be able to uh, have this um, IGC together at the same time also with Albania and really to open the cluster and start the real work. Montenegro is there. It has all tools available to move forward. And I would say also Serbia. But uh, in case of Serbia, some kind of real political will will need to be found because without adhering to our values and standards and to, to our CFSP, uh, they really cannot move forward as a serious uh, EU candidate. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me pass on a question from uh, Kurt Bassuner. Um, and he says, if EU accession is about transformation, which you said, then should it not be articulated by the EU and member state leaders that the Dayton Agreement structure impedes Bosnia and Herzegovina's entry into the EU and into NATO for that matter? Well, um, I would not agree uh, with that kind of statement uh, because various states have various uh, internal structure, constitutional structure, and um, Dayton Peace Accord brought peace to Bosnia and Herzegovina. It is one state, two entities, 
three constituent peoples and others all need to be treated uh, equally. And um, it is a complex system, but this is at the moment the only way in which the country really can function. And um, there is still uh, this uh, electoral reform which needs to be done in Bosnia and Herzegovina to address both the uh, decisions of the European Court of Human Rights on Sejic Finci and to address the decision of the Constitutional Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, uh, which said that uh, electoral system really needs to ensure um, representation of each and every nation uh, uh, in a proper way. And without having that kind of um, electoral system in place, um, Bosnia and Herzegovina really cannot uh, function uh, um, to the extent it, uh, it can. Once this is done, I'm really confident that uh, this topic will not be so high in the focus of, uh, of the leaders down there and that they will then be able to move uh, forward uh, on their EU path. In accordance with Dayton, you have uh, foreign judges in the uh, Constitutional Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina. You have a uh, high representative, but this will change. But I would say throughout this transformation process of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, to request this to change now would simply block Bosnia and Herzegovina moving forward. Give them time throughout the process, throughout the years to come, also to reshape uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, in accordance of the will of, of the people, peoples uh, living there. All right, thank you very much. Um, another question from Emma Richardson, and it's about Russia, uh, which you mentioned in your presentation. And she says, uh, to what extent would you say that Russia is influencing the Western Balkans and in what areas? And how can the EU help to prevent further Russian influence? And if I could just add to that, um, China is also active in the Western Balkans through its Belt and Road Initiative. So to what extent is that also a, a complicating factor in the uh, preparation of these countries for accession? Uh, yes. Um... Well, Russian influence <clears throat> is quite visible here in the region. We have an obvious suspect, uh, one Western Balkan country who does not even hide its close connections to Russia. And um, Serbia by now has not really decided where it sees its future. Although I would say they know that uh, their only future is and should be within the EU. But uh, this should also come to the knowledge of their population and to their leadership. And at the moment, I would say uh, the media freedom are uh, quite restricted and uh, um, this strong pro-Russian influence is more than present in, 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 in Serbia. Um, one can see, you mentioned China, uh, Russia. Um, within Serbia, you can hear that China is investing in Serbia, that Russia is offering its assistance. Although we all know that EU is the major investor in, uh, in Western Balkans and in Serbia. And I think we should do on our side more to make it uh, knowledgeable also to the by the public in, in, in Serbia. I know it, it's very difficult to counter that kind of narrative if you have uh, the leadership who is not open for that kind of uh, uh, conversation or uh, but but still I think we should be keep on saying and keep on showing how much EU has already done and invested in the, in the Serbia and that their real uh, future lies uh, uh, within it. But first, they need to realize it also uh, by themselves. Um, 
Also in, North, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the influence of Russia is quite visible. And uh, I would say it is a strange thing that in Bosnia and Herzegovina, you can see the influence of Russia, but also influence of Serbia. So Serbia is also a small uh, uh, regional um, actor, which also actively acts towards its neighbors, be it Bosnia and Herzegovina, be it Montenegro, but even, even most North Macedonia, of course, not mentioning uh, Kosovo. And uh, with this narrative of Serbian world, which is copy-paste of the Russian world, um, it is not helpful. And this is something which we should uh, fight against and show, not only to Serbia, but also to the, uh, their neighbors, being Bosnia and Herzegovina and Montenegro, that uh, their real future lies within the EU and that the prosperity of their citizens, their economy lies there. Uh, the biggest economic partner of uh, the Western Balkans is uh, EU and we should work, work on it, uh, showing uh, those facts. Okay, thank you very much. And a question from Jill Donahue in the Institute. Um, and she asks, what are the impediments to the creation of a common regional market in the Western Balkans, uh, which is one of the pillars of the growth plan? Yeah, uh, we are really in favor of um, establishment of common regional market. And mm -hmm. it is really of a strategic importance and it simply allows uh, deeper economic integration of the whole region and somehow prepare it later on for entering. There are lots of impediments and uh, the political will needs to be somehow found uh, among Western Balkan six to work on it. And uh, we really believe that this new growth plan for Western Balkans is a perfect tool somehow to uh, show them uh, um, that this is taking part in it and using funds in parallel to uh, undertaking reforms uh, is the right way to close the economic gap and for those countries to move forward. And I think we should work on promoting uh, uh, those topics. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're coming close to the end of our time, but there are two questions that I would like to, to, to hear, um, hear your views on before we finish. Uh, the first is from Dylan Marshall, also in the Institute, and he asks about how the European Parliament elections in June, how the outcome of those elections might affect the enlargement process, given that there is an expectation that uh, the centre of gravity in the Parliament will shift to some extent to the right. Mm -hmm. Well, we do hope that uh, this, uh, no matter uh, what uh, the uh, results of the EU parla parliamentarian elections will be, that EU, uh, the European Parliament and the Council, and that uh, will found the strength and interest to uh, work further on the enlargement. And to be honest, I really do not see European Parliament being um, contrary to the uh, now this new uh, newly found uh, reinvigorated enlargement uh, policy there may be some maybe differences about the pace dynamics but um, I would say for Western Balkans but also for uh, this um, Eastern partnership trio um, there'll be a uh, green light also uh, in the new institutional set of, setting of the EU after the European Parliament elections. Okay, thank you very much. And a final question, um, President Charles Michel, the President of the European Council, has proposed a so-called confidence clause in the accession treaties uh, to mitigate concerns about the Western Balkan member state abusing its veto power uh, to prevent a neighbor's accession because of past conflicts. 
Um, what, can you give us your view on this proposal? Do you think it would be helpful or, or, or would, it, it would it impede progress? Uh, well, uh, Croatia is open for, for, for discussing it. Um, but I would say this is the part of the overall discussion, how the enlargements should proceed, what kind of EU we want to have in the enlarged, uh, once it is enlarged, what would we, would we have various circus, uh, would we have um, 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 and I really believe that um, this may sound quite discouraging for those countries which are in the accession process not maybe because uh, they really do plan to block at this point of time uh, its, its neighbors but it would show that they will be regarded uh, differently maybe somehow to be a um, second uh, grade um, members, members of the EU. So I would be quite cautious about it. Let's see how the overall enlargement process mm -hmm. uh, will, will move forward. I mean, from the moment of entering, uh, signing the agreement of accession, then you have, it needs to enter into force. So there is a time frame in which the other countries may also get on the board. And I mean, I would say it is a little bit too early to be very firm on, 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 on that kind of views. Let us see how the enlargement would uh, move. And um, once again, it is extremely important to, cher to, uh, to develop and to, to cherish this um, culture of compromise of, uh, of good friendly relations. And I think through these soft mechanisms, we can really ensure that ultimately there will be no form of blocking of one country vis-a-vis uh, -vis another one. Thank you very much. I think you said something very important there that uh, we all need to think about what sort of Europe we want uh, to emerge from the enlargement process, because just as the last major enlargement changed the nature of the European Union, as well as its size and its functioning, I think the same is likely for the next wave of enlargement. And so we need to, uh, I think, perhaps think about what concept of Europe we want to, to see at the end of, of the process. So, so thank you very much uh, for an extremely interesting and wide ranging discussion. You've covered many different points and you've been very open uh, in your, your answers to, the, to our questions. So um, uh, thank you very much again uh, for your presentation. Um, I would like to thank also Tara and Lorcan in the Institute for the administrative and technical support. Um, and I would like to thank everybody who has tuned into this discussion this morning for for your attendance. So thank you very much, State Secretary. You have definitely, I think, given us a lot to think about and a lot of very valuable insights. Thank yeah, you very well, much. Well, thank you for having me and for the exchange we had. All the best. Yeah. Thank you very much.